So before we get, begin, I'd, uh, I'd like to tell a short little story about my uncle. Uh, he's a math teacher over in Newcastle and uh, rather unorthodox at that one. Uh, one of his favorite things to do at the beginning of each semester is kind of go off on a little tirade. Um, and it goes something like this. He says, uh, says, guys, the world's greatest motivator is love. Love will make you walk through the fire and the flames, and love will make you climb up the highest mountain. It can make you work 80-hour work weeks. But there ain't much of that around here. So we're going to use the next best thing, fear. <laughs> and judging by the sheer number of people who passed this class, we've come to the conclusion that fear really doesn't clot our critical thinking skills. And judging by the grades that I got in that class, I came to the conclusion that fear actually doesn't change what is right and what is wrong. Now courage. Courage is us humans using our critical thinking skills to, to analyze what is right and what is wrong, and to do the right thing even in the face of fear. Now a perfect example of this is the team that operated the world's first nuclear reactor. CP-1, also known as Chicago Pile-1, was operated by Fermi and his team of nuclear engineers. It was effectively a pile of graphite bricks and nuclear material that was just kind of pushed together and it was assembled underneath an abandoned football stadium. Now these researchers, they knew they were going into uncharted territory and they knew when they took their final lunch together that they may not be going home that night. But in spite of that fear, they still saw the potential that nuclear energy held for humanity and they went forth anyway. And their groundbreaking research was what kicked off the atomic era. So they did know a little bit going into the experiment, but they didn't know everything, and that was the scary part. So a few years before, we observed nuclear fission. Now nuclear fission is when you take an atom that's inherently unstable, and you either give it enough time or you throw something at it. Now when you throw something at it, this atom breaks apart and it releases energy in the form of particle radiation and heat. Now these particles, they fly off, and you know what? They hit other atoms. And when they hit other atoms, they release even more particles. And this chain reaction continues. This heat that's generated is what creates our energy from nuclear power. Especially in current commercial reactors that will pressurize this water. It'll go through a turbine, which will then be powering a generator, which will then bring the rest of the energy onto the grid to power everything from your iPhone to your laptop. Now, how do we keep a nuclear reactor from turning into a nuclear bomb? Well, the easiest way to control the power output is to control the amount of particles available to cause more atoms to break apart. So we have these things called control rods. And what we do is we physically lower the control rods into the fuel bundles. This reduces the amount of radiation that's occurring and reduces the power output, controlling the reaction. So with the molten salt reactor experiment, that actually originated from kind of an original idea. Uh, let's backtrack a little bit first, because when we talk about nuclear reactors, it's, uh, there's this common conception that we have about them. They're all pressurized water reactors, and that's what's currently in operation. Now, the federal government in the 1960s, they decided that they wanted to have an airplane that could fly for months on end. And instead of actually learning how to refuel in flight, they decided it might actually just be easier to put a nuclear reactor inside of an airplane. Now, there are a couple problems that you run into when you have a pressurized water reactor inside of an aircraft. Most notably, they're huge. Also, they're very heavy, and if you have that flying in air, you can't take off and land willy-nilly because if anything happens with the pressurization, it's going to look a lot like what happened at Fukushima. So the answer to this was a complete overhaul in their thinking and reimagining of the nuclear technologies of the time. And the capstone of this was the molten salt reactor experiment. It was a new idea. It would be able to operate off of fuel that is at atmospheric pressure. It's molten instead of solid. And on top of that, they realized something interesting, that they could even look at using a new fuel source. So when most people think about nuclear reactors, the first thought of their mind is, well, uranium, right? Uh, what most people don't know is it's a very special type of uranium that's required to power nuclear reactors. As you can see here, we mine a lot of uranium, but we only get a very small amount of usable nuclear fuel out of that. And when we throw it into the reactor, we burn even less of that fuel. Furthermore, the waste that's produced by that reactor is extremely long-lived. And this is where a lot of the controversy around nuclear power comes from, is because we have to think about how we're going to store this waste for the next millennia. Now, what most people don't know about was thorium. Now, this was briefly experimented with back in the atomic era. And it was found that it was really bad at making bombs. And what we really wanted was bombs. And so we kind of scrapped thorium, right? 
And so the cool thing about thorium is we can take this only, the one and only isotope of thorium, turn it into a fuel, put it inside of a reactor, and we can burn it more efficiently. And on top of that, the waste is less long lived. So we don't have to take special consideration into storing it for thousands and thousands of years. We only have to let it decay for hundreds of years, which compared to uranium is quite a bit less longer. So the trick behind the thorium reactors is that thorium is actually a really pretty stable element. It's not very radioactive, especially not compared to uranium. I've actually got some of it sitting in my room right now. So if you want to turn this into a nuclear fuel source, what we're going to have to do is take some of those particles, we're going to have to you know, throw them at the, at the thorium. The thorium is then going to transmute into uranium. And at that point, it becomes unstable and it becomes a fissile fuel. It's able to become unstable. It breaks apart, giving off more of those neutrons that are able to perpetuate its own reaction. Now what we have here is what I like to call the chocolate and peanut butter effect. We have a, a nice vessel or a nice reactor type that we can stick our fuel in, and we have an optimal fuel. And this actually gives us a new type of nuclear reactor. It'll have zero fuel pressure, so we don't have to worry about any large driving forces putting nuclear material up into the atmosphere if anything happens. There's a closed loop design. There's also a self-regulating mechanism in it. The, the laws of physics that actually operate behind this keep it from being too hot and melting down. It also prevents it from seizing up and to cease reacting. It's safe using a safer, more abundant fuel. And actually what we have shown here is a flow diagram that uh, lays out that the fissile material is going to be in the core of the reactor. The thorium, the fertile material, will be surrounding that. Neutrons will go into the thorium blanket, which will then be separated off, and then that fissile material will be put back into the core, which will be generating heat from that fission, which will pass through the primary and then secondary heat exchangers, finally going on to our turbine to generate electricity. So why should you even care about all of this other than just being kind of a, a nifty new way to make energy? Well, there's more than meets the eye to this. It can desalinate water with a closed system. We'll be working at temperatures in excess of 110 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to purify and desalinate water. Ask California right now, I think they might be interested in that. It'll be able to provide medical isotopes, not just for cancer treatment, but for research as well. We can utilize uranium waste as a fuel source, so we don't have to worry about adding more and more to that problem. We already know that Yucca Mountain's gone, so we're going to have to figure out something else to do with all of that waste. This can actually solve that problem. It can prevent nuclear warfare. I know right now we're concerned about a lot of nations that are wanting to delve more and more into nuclear energy, and this is a safe alternative. They aren't able to make warheads from this, certainly not efficiently enough to actually do it on any sizable way. It'll be able to aid in space exploration and colonization, and I know that's a little far off, but honestly, that's where, that's where I'm hoping this heads. And on top of that, we can also help with disaster relief. If there's no way to get a generator into a location that's been hit by, say, a hurricane, these can be airlifted into any location and they can continue to operate. That can provide pure water and it can also provide clean energy to people in need of it. It can also be used in military bases because a vast majority of attacks on logistics operations are bringing in energy and water to troops and this can remedy that. And on top of this, it proves itself a very viable answer to the global energy crisis. Now you might be asking yourself, Connor, there's so many proven and safer methods of energy generation. Why don't we just use those instead? Well, the sun's not always going to shine. The wind's not always going to blow. And uh, well, right now we're having issues getting coal across the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. Um, so whenever somebody asks me this question, I just show them this comic up here. If you can you know, see by the exact number of zeros past uh, that uranium has over any traditional chemical fuel, we can store it so much more dense. We can store an entire person's lifetime worth of energy. Just think of all the gallons of gas that we burn on a daily basis. We can relegate all of that to one single fuel pellet the size of a ping pong ball your entire lifetime. And I also like to accompany it with this uh, graph behind me here on your left. Um, and it shows a correlation between average daily wage and access to power. Imagine shipping these ping pong ball sized chunks of fuel accompanied by their appropriate reactor and shielding off to these countries that do not have access. Think of the innovation that could occur then. So what makes this relevant? Well, first off, Susie and I have a pretty strong passion for nuclear energy. So naturally we decided it would be good to start a business together. 
What you see behind us here is a prototype fuel cask. It's a three-dimensional rendering. We didn't bring it with us today. Uh, but we're actually using it, and we're going to be testing uh, fuel transfer methods this summer. So that's really exciting, because we can actually use this to simulate an actual molten salt reactor. We're doing this in sort of a Fermi-like fashion. You know, We're using excess lab space in our garages to do all this. And <laughs> just like the beginning of the nuclear era, we're pioneering this on our own. Now, there are a lot of concerns when it comes to nuclear technology, and a lot of them are very founded concerns. But we feel that we can't just sit by and be too scared to use this technology when it has the potential for such groundbreaking research and the ability to improve so many people's lives. It goes back to what Fermi and his crew was working on. They knew that they could step back and sit by the wayside and not do anything that's too dangerous or too groundbreaking or too much work or effort. But we feel that now is especially the time that we can go forth and actually make a difference. So please, folks, think critically. The future is waiting.